right. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Soto Barca, and I am a second year medical student here at UTRGV. I wanted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Morley. So Dr. John Morley is a professor at St. Louis University School of Medicine. He retired as the director of the Division of Geriatric Medicine on June 30th, 2019, after 30 years of service. He has edited more than 20 books and published more than 1,400 papers with major research emphases on the role of neuropeptides in the modulation of hormonal responses and behavior and on nutrition, geriatric assessments, sarcopenia, cachexia diabetes, and hormones in the elderly. Now I would like to uh, leave the floor to Dr. Dr. Morley. Hi, well, it's great to be back and I have to show you my coronavirus again because he's watched the whole of this wonderful morning and I've watched him get more and more depressed as he realizes that all with these brilliant people out there, these brilliant young people, that the chance of him surviving much longer is less and less. So he is unhappy, but it has made me very happy to listen to the morning. And now I will try and show my screen and share it with you, which sometimes I can do well and sometimes I can't. Uh, okay, where's it gone? There we are. Okay, come on. And down here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go through looking at aging in the time of COVID-19. Uh, as we've heard a lot about COVID, it's a coronavirus. As all of you know, it came out of uh, Wuhan in the Hubei province. You can see my pangolin sitting behind me who was wearing his mask as he always does and getting very annoyed that people tend to sometimes blame him for this pandemic because he says he was not responsible and the bat has decided he'll wear a mask just to prove that it doesn't matter, he can still be responsible. And as we all know, at this, uh, starting in Wuhan, there were two forms of the virus. The first one actually came to the west coast of the United States and it went to Northern California. The cases were relatively mild and then it went to Washington State. Uh, there it got into a nursing home and whenever coronavirus gets into the nursing home, you have many more problems, but it was not an overwhelmingly severe virus. The other form of coronavirus flew its way to Milan in Northern Italy. And in Milan and Northern Italy, as you know, we had a huge pandemic breakout. And from there, people flew to New York and other parts of the United States. And that gave us the more severe form of the virus. We know now that this virus mutates a lot. And recently in Thailand, a more severe um, which a virus which is even more infectious has been seen. So what do we have to worry about? We're in a pandemic and who gets into trouble? People who have comorbidity get into trouble. Uh, people who are old and their immune system isn't working as well. And if you're old and frail, it seems as if, at least on a few studies, that the frail older people do worse than those people who are not as frail, and then people with high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, cardiovascular disease all do worse. There's some data to suggest that uh, African American or Blacks and Hispanics may have a worse outcome, but in a recent study, which you can see on the left-hand side, they actually showed that if you correct for comorbidity and you correct for socioeconomic status, there is not much difference. So it looks as if these differences are really related as much to socioeconomic differences, which is important to recognize because in medicine, we often tend to, particularly not the social workers here, but the physicians tend to forget that we have to look at a person's social status and what is going on in their life when we want to fix their diseases. So I thought I'd start with two uh, case histories for you. These are both friends of mine. They are both uh, geriatricians. They're both in their 50s. And uh, the first one shows you the mild version, and the second one shows you a much less mild version. Matteo Cesari is the head of geriatrics in Milan, uh, and basically he was one of the early people to get uh, COVID. He, as he said, he had a relatively mild form of COVID-19, did not need to go to hospital, but spent two months of quarantine at home. The thoughts he had about it was his biggest problem 
was his fear that he would infect or had infected his children and his wife. And that worried him more than anything else. The second part of this period for him with COVID was being closed in his room, isolated from the rest of the family, the silence outside in the streets, except for the frequent sound of ambulances, feelings of sadness and weakness in front of the magnitude of what was happening. It was extremely confusing how to deal with the unknown disease. Every day, a new article of false facts was pointing to the, uh, the miraculous effects of a certain drug. Should I take everything or wait for evidence? The evidence-based issue uh, of Matteo with COVID was for him one of the most important parts of what he dealt with. Uh, Matteo is particularly interested in evidence-based medicine. And as he points out, every evening he was uh, indeed physically and mentally exhausted. The second patient was Alfonso Jose Cruz Gentov, uh, also a good friend of mine. He is from Madrid. And he pointed out that his started on a Sunday in the mountains, more precisely near the summit of Cerrero del La Alemana, next to the Robledo de Chavela, and I can't speak Spanish, obviously, where I noticed the first chill that I attributed to an imbalance between the amount of warm clothing and the coldness of the wind. Nothing else. I felt strong and capable. I returned home after more than 15 kilometers of hiking in perfect physical shape. Uh, over the next few days, he says, he found himself extremely weak and tired with a, growing, a constant dry cough, growing fever, and particularly annoying symptoms. Everything tasted bad, sweet or salty, with excessive uh, perception and without nuances or play, flavors. And he continued working and he continued cough, coughing until one day an occupational therapist said to him, get the hell out of here. I don't want to get sick from you. And you may not know you're sick, but you need to go home. And so he went home reluctantly. And as he says, many doctors sin of presentism, defined as going to work with diseases with which we would prohibit our patients from doing any activity. As a consequence of a responsibility, perhaps misunderstood, associated with chronic shortage of public health personnel, we tend to continue to work. And this is a picture of him with me in Taiwan at the end of last year, uh, basically at a Disney display. And I think both of us tend to often to behave like the Disney characters. So as we go on, you don't have to feel too sorry for him. Some of this is his own fault. Uh, don't tell him I said that. Uh, so he, eventually his wife said to him, he was staying at home. She stayed up all night, was convinced he was going to die. She's a family practitioner. And she said, I think I'm taking you to hospital today. Uh, he complained bitterly, but she took him in. And a couple of days later, two ICU doctors came to see me. They said it was a courtesy call being a partner. I began to consider the fact that you may need mechanical ventilation, sleeping without knowing if you will wake up. It's not nice to think about it. It didn't help improve my mental fragility in those days. It was impossible for me to sleep face down. So as you know, most people do better when they're prone. He could not be prone for reasons that made no sense. For almost two months, uh, he still can remember the first night that he could lie on his stomach again. <clears throat> and after a week, the oxygen saturation continued to drop. He was unable to inspire deeply with a burning sensation, difficult to describe, and a desynchronization in his breathing. After a time, about uh, three to four weeks, he slowly started a rehabilitation program. He stopped using the oxygen concentrator and started doing breathing exercises and walking, first five minutes around the room. I remained exhausted, but it was going to be better every day, a little more, until I got to walk over an hour at home. At first, I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without stopping. Little by little, I came to do three stairs in a row, yet yeah, drowned and desaturated, improving slower than what I would want, trying to gain weight. After the summer, I hope to go back up some mountain. When I get to the top, I will know I am the same again. And you see him there, in Taiwan, uh, drinking some Chinese wine, and his wife looking at him in disgust, which is, I assume, how she looked at him when he was refusing to go to hospital as he was getting sicker and sicker. 
So those are two cases that give us an example of what might happen. When we think about uh, coronavirus or COVID-19, it has multiple symptoms, mostly related to the fact that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor is spread throughout the body. So the classical early symptoms are cough, sore throat, dyspnea, chills, and hypoxia. Usually, the severe forms have high fever, but in older people, there often is no fever at all. Delirium is a very common approach, uh, uh, presentation in older people, along with encephalopathy, headache, falls and problems with mobility and stroke are also more common in older people. Uh, we know that you can't smell well, you have decreased taste, and you also older people develop an anorexia and start to get severe weight loss. Um, older people with type 2 diabetes often have the COVID invading the islets of Langerhans, getting rid of the insulin and turning them into a type 1 diabetic with ketoacidosis. You can get hepatitis, myocarditis and myocardial infarction are not rare. Chilblains are a dermatological presentation due to peripheral vascular disease with clotting and basically also they get deep vein thrombosis. Kidney injury, colitis and diarrhea are also there. Muscles tend to hurt, the myalgias, but they also get a severe muscle wasting as the cytokines go up with cachexia and sarcopenia. In a number of cases near the end, they have a marked release of cytokines, the so-called cytokine storm, which is one of the things, this inflammation that kills them. Uh, as far as abnormal labs, D-dimer is most probably the most important because it suggests that you may have had a pulmonary embolus and also they can develop syndrome of inappropriate ADH with hyponatremia. Uh, this just shows you the difference between young people with fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and older people where the way they produce may be reduced mobility, delirium, and falls. The sides, two uh, insets at the bottom, are basically telling you that anybody in hospital should have to exercise for at least 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon. Incredible study done by Mikhail Esquerdo in the Spanish hospital has shown that older people in hospital, when they exercise, are much more likely to get better, much more likely to go home, and will do remarkably well. And it doesn't seem to matter whether this is with COVID or not. So we need to change how hospitals work because most hospitals tell people to stay in bed because that's where you belong, because you might fall. And that is sort of really stupid, okay? Uh, just to point out that a big part of COVID is, first of all, when we isolate people, they tend not to move around and they lose muscle mass at that time called sarcopenia. And then when they get the inflammatory uh, cytokines, they get increased cachexia and both of these get themselves into trouble. So we have to recognize that we have to look for sarcopenia in older people. There's now data suggesting older people come into hospital with sarcopenia and COVID do worse, and then if they develop uh, cachexia, which is best measured by looking at a C-reactive protein and an albumin level, if the C-reactive protein is high, albumin low, this suggests cachexia. Uh, what about people with dementia? COVID is extremely difficult for them because it causes confusion, delirium, fear, helplessness, anger, depression, and uh, denial. They don't understand why they have to be socially isolated. And in the social situations, they want to know, where are my friends? Why can't I see my family? Uh, who, who will look after me? And very importantly, if they stay at home with dementia, they cannot remember to take their medications. Delirium starts very early in many of the older people with COVID. And if it's not picked, picked up, it gets into trouble. Uh, it gets put them into trouble. And an important thing to remember is you do not tie down or physically restrain older people. If you want to do that, it's basically torture. You're going to have much worse outcomes. And basically, if you were in the United Kingdom, you would finish up losing your license as a health professional. In the United States, it seems that we still 
have no problem in tying down older people because we can't be bothered to put the effort in that it takes to look after someone with delirium. And as you may guess, as a geriatrician, this is one of the areas that annoys me greatly. And I, through 30 years, I've tried to get rid of restraints. And it seems that most hospitalists don't understand this. Many other people don't understand it. I like to show this. Uh, Dr. Rana Ardish wrote a book in shock. She had a uh, was having a baby. Uh, she had a liver bleed. She died, I think, three times or came close to dying. And in the middle of one of them, she actually heard the physicians around her saying, she's circling the drain. She won't be with us much longer. So she makes the point that you've got to be careful what you say in front of people. But when the uh, COVID outbreak took place, she works in the ICU at uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, she recognized that many, many of the healthcare providers were not coping with the pandemic and the deaths. So she started to go around and talk to them every day. And this made a huge difference to the staff there where they could discuss the problems they were having because many healthcare professionals feel we're weak when we don't discuss the problems, and that's really a bad thing to do. So she's made a big difference. One of the earlier questions was about what happens uh, after you finish with COVID, and this picture here shows you that many people may have confusion, anorexia, fatigue, they keep the conjunctivitis, the red eyes, they have a cough, they may have chest pain, which is related to a myocarditis, coronavirus basically uh, uh, invades the myocardial muscles and that gets you into problems. And you can have joint pain. To realize how bad this may be, we can use the example of Eduardo Rodriguez, who plays for the Boston Red Sox. I believe he can pitch, but I don't like anything about the Boston Red Sox, so this doesn't matter. Uh, but he, he tried to start again after he was healthy, and he could not get through pitching in innings. He was getting too tired, and this was related to his heart failure related to the COVID. Rehabilitation is extraordinarily important. Uh, as one person said, I couldn't stand, I couldn't walk, I couldn't get myself out of bed uh, by myself, and now I can walk. Uh, she said, I'm walking with a walker. We need speech, cognition, basic activities, and physical therapy. And nursing homes do tremendously badly. We have large numbers of people in nursing homes who have comorbidity and are older. This is a population at great risk. This is a population who need to have personal protective equipment for all the staff, regular testing of the staff and patients. And importantly, we need to not take untested patients from the hospital. The isolation is a problem. And the government, whether it's Democratic or Republican throughout the country, has done a terrible uh, job at providing the testing, uh, helping to provide the PPE. And you have to be able to have people visit you when you've got something like COVID. And it's important to recognize that most persons in nursing homes who have COVID can be positive without symptoms. It's absolutely important to social distance. The wonderful study done in China at a restaurant showed that one person who basically had COVID went into a restaurant because of the air conditioning and movement of air, 11 other people got COVID. So we need to remember you stay six feet apart or you finish up six feet under. And very importantly, you have to wear a mask. The data for wearing masks now is extraordinarily good. And if our leaders don't wear masks and don't tell us to wear masks, we're not ever going to get rid of a pandemic. It's the first and the best thing for primary and secondary prevention and even tertiary prevention. We have to basically wear masks. You notice the young lady there wearing a mask where she's got a plastic piece so you can see her mouth. When you deal with older people, this is absolutely essential because older people mostly lip read. And if they can't see your mouth moving, they can't hear what you're saying. And this means that you're not communicating well. So very important to have masks that are appropriate for older people. Social isolation, this has been a loneliness epidemic with the COVID. We know that many older people are lonely to start with and lonely people develop stress, depression, poor quality of life, poor sleep, worsening, worsening mentation impaired function, cardiovascular disease, increased hospitalization, increased mortality. Uh, Ex-Surgeon General pointed out during my years caring for patients, 
the most common pathology I saw was not heart, heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. So students can always help by volunteering to talk to people on the phone, to talk to them on iPad, to help decrease the loneliness as much as we can. Importantly is ageism, and there was a question of an ageism earlier today, and this basically, COVID-19 was called the boomer remover, which is about as ageist as you can get. In Italy, where 23% of the population is over 65, a number of the hospitals in Norma, Nor Northern Italy uh, use chronological age-based cutoffs to ration ventilators. If you were over 65, you couldn't get a ventilator. They explain this as distributive justice. Many healthy young adults initially ignore the recommendations to wear masks and socially isolate to protect their older uh, relatives. Uh, you could call this basically neglectful justice. And then Governor Dan Patrick in Texas, we have a lot of Texans on this, suggested that old people, including himself, would volunteer to die so Americans don't. Um, this is benevolent, uh, but it's only benevolent if you are agreeing to do it. So I hope uh, your governor in Texas went out and <laughs> worked with people with COVID without them having a mask, without him having a mask, so that he could find out that he was quite happy to go ahead and die. I think this is really disgraceful from my point of view as a physician who does not feel uh, uh, ageism is uh, important. And it's important where you count. For a lot of time, we were not counting the deaths in the nursing homes, which was a form of ageism. Finally, I have to point out that when people with COVID die, you have a major problem with their relatives because they have not been allowed to be around their patients, their relatives with COVID. And basically, they tend to have a lot of guilt, anger, anger, sadness, they feel helpless, and not being there in a loved one's time of need, not being able to communicate with family members in a natural way, not being able to say goodbye, not participating in normal rituals. This makes the bereavement much worse. And in the number of social worker students here, it's gonna to fall to you to work with people who are extremely bereaved following the death of people with COVID. So in the last couple of minutes, which I most probably run over because I always do, I wanna share with you a few poems. The first one was written in 1869 when there was an epidemic, but it was reprinted during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1919. Please remember the Spanish flu epidemic actually started in Kansas. So we blame Spain, not Kansas, which we should have. So the first poem is, this is timeless. And people stayed at home and read books and listened. And they rested and did exercises and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened more deeply. Someone meditated, someone pray, prayed, someone met their shadow and people began to think differently. And people healed and in the absence of people who lived there in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless and heartless, the earth also began to heal. And when the danger ended and people found themselves, they grieved for the dead and made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of living and completely healed the earth just as they were healed. So looking at the second poem by Donna Ashworth, I will start near the bottom. Uh, history will remember when people on their balconies in isolation, uh, but so very much together in courage and song. History will remember when people for, the, uh, for their old and their weak protected the vulnerable by doing nothing at all. History will remember when the virus disappeared and the houses opened and the people came out and hugged and kissed and started again kinder than before. So to finish, uh, this is imagine a bedtime story that you're going to tell your grandchildren in about 50 years time. Imagine when the world was covered by pollution, not a star could be seen in the sky. White Americans shot, shot young black men for fun. A war was built to keep immigrants out. The UK brexited from the EU. Ageism and racism were common. Children starved throughout the world. Middle-aged people in the United States died from obesity. The ruler in Saudi Arabia had a journalist killed and few cared. From Yemen and Africa to beyond, people fought at wars. A little man in North Korea threatened to start a nuclear war. Imagine things could get worse when a small virus with a crown swept through the world, 
killing large numbers of people. Some called it the boom of a mover. Others just said no ventilators for the old, or said old folks will die to save the young. People isolated in their houses, and some became depressed. We masked and didn't come within two weeks, meters of one another. Well, a few did. Pollution disappeared. Others got guns and protested that they should not need to stay at home to save old people. There was not enough PPE for the health providers. There was an economic crisis with no people working. Many could not afford food. Those who already had three or more guns went out to buy more to shoot the little virus. Politicians blamed everybody but themselves. But imagine, and then came a vaccine. People no longer stayed inside. People no longer wore masks or socially distanced. People were much nicer to one another. People used electric cars and flew less to keep pollution away. People were excited to go to football games. But then they went back to being as they were before, self-centered, not caring about others, and the world was sad again. I finished by showing you this young lady here of 107 who actually had Spanish flu in 1918 and had COVID uh, sometime this year and uh, survived both of them. She was an artist and uh, you can see some of her artwork. And the lady Maria Belanas from uh, uh, Spain there had COVID and survived when she was 113. So as we'll say, the storm will pass, the sun will shine again and vaccines will come. Uh, we look forward to the future and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morley. Our first question is, how can we prevent ageism when ICUs, ventilators, and other resources are scarce? So, you know, the reality is there are people aged 30 who are not going to survive COVID no matter what we do for them because they've got multiple diseases. They may have done many things to hurt their body. And I don't see why that person should have a better chance than one of those 80 year olds who survived COVID, who were healthy and had looked after themselves all their life. I think you don't make decisions in medicine based on a person's age. You look at the person, you see, are they frail? Do they have problems? Uh, are they unlikely to survive? Uh, we use a frail NH that we've developed that can pick up the people who you know are not going to survive. And that doesn't matter whether they are 50 or 70, they don't need to go on a ventilator. Importantly, we need to make sure that everybody has developed an advanced directive. And those advanced directives should be in place way before they get COVID. Uh, in the state of Missouri, we looked at over 10,000 people. And of those 10,000 people, 30% did not have advanced directives. Now we're looking at people over the age of 65. Anybody over the age of 65 has to make decisions of what do they want? Do they want to go on a ventilator? Do they want to be resuscitated? Do they want to be tube fit? And we have to have reasonable discussions. Uh, CMS will pay for a single visit to a doctor to allow, or for an advanced practice nurse or a social worker, to allow the person to write out the advanced directives appropriately. So the answer is, it's ages to just say, I'll give this only to young people, like most of you. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, deserve it. Uh, there will be at least one or two of you who most probably, if we knew well, we'd say, well, we shouldn't give it to, that's how life is. But some of you may be sick and not going to survive anyhow. But really and honestly, the decisions are not made on age. They're made on your frailty, on your comorbidity, on your chances of surviving the disease and how useful the ventilator will be. And Matteo Cesari, who worked in uh, Northern uh, Milan, where, where actually they did do this over the age of 65, you could not get a ventilator uh, during this time. And he is still extremely angry about it. He said he saw people die who never should have died and we know now, by the way, that putting many people on a ventilator actually killed them was one of the things about the treatment of COVID. If you could foam people or you could put them on a, with an oxygen helmet, they tended to do much better than if they got ventilated. And this had to do with uh, lung dynamics and things like that. But we recognize that maybe we were killing people off and saving old people by not giving them ventilators early on. 
Thank you. Another question that we have is, since the pandemic, do you recommend that everyone, including young adults in their early 20s, should have an advanced directive? I believe that everyone should have an advanced directive. I believe it's not the job of a healthcare professional to tell someone what they should or shouldn't want, certainly not in the United States where we've got unending resources to give medical care. Granted, those resources are wasted, in my opinion, mostly on the rich insurance companies, the rich pharmaceutical companies, but we spend unending money on care. Therefore, if somebody wants the care, if they can tolerate the care, it should be there for them. I think, on the other hand, I talk to lots of my patients in my life about advanced directives that I found that many, many of them did not want the care. And they were the ones who were getting care that was ridiculous when they went to hospital. So you have to start young. Uh, you don't know if you're 21 and you go home from this meeting and you're so excited about it, you're thinking how you're going to cure COVID and you run in your car into somebody else or somebody else from the meeting runs into you and you then finish up in a hospital and there needs to make decisions. Those decisions, even at 22, you should have had the right to say, this is what I want, this is not what I want. Thank you. Another question for you. How has the transition to telehealth been with the geriatric community? So basically, this has been a disaster for older people. I was at a meeting in Toulouse. I, I'm 74, by the way, so I'm an older person. So I can say what I like about older people and not be excessively ageist. Okay? Uh, so, but fundamentally, I was in Toulouse in a meeting with my wife. Uh, we heard that you couldn't get back into the United States uh, if you didn't get back the next day. So we flew back the next day, which turned out to be nonsense because everybody in customs was too scared to see us. And they stood way, way away. Nobody told us we should isolate, but we isolated for two weeks. And I did not go back to re uh, work for the first month and a half, seeing I'm sort of semi-retired. I only work about 12 hours a day now, and that's retirement for me. Uh, so, but, but Basically, I could do most of my work at home. But the reality is what happened is everybody stopped exercising. People were staying at home, not getting out, not walking, not doing anything. And so what we're seeing is people coming into hospital or in nursing homes, losing five, 10, 20 pounds of weight. And then when they've lost 20 pounds of weight, getting infected with COVID, adding the cachexia and getting into real trouble. Uh, in addition to that, isolation has led to basically a lot of anxiety and depression amongst older people. Isolation is a terrible disease. Uh, at St. Louis University, we've developed Circles of Friends, which is a Finland uh, program where you bring together older people who are lonely and get them to talk and have friends. Because if you have no friends, your life is very bad. And uh, just for the social workers listening, need to please remember that uh, half of the people who have no friends have no friends because like me, they talk too much and nobody wants to be around, you know. So half of the time it's the old person's fault they have no friends. The other half of the time it's the other people's fault. So we have to develop programs and we're doing a lot of telehealth with the circle of friends and with cognitive stimulation therapy to try and keep people active and thinking and also doing exercise programs. In Singapore, one of my colleagues has developed a whole series of videos called the Happy Pro uh, uh, Program for older people who have been isolated during the COVID epidemic. They used to do this within the uh, housing complexes there, but now they're doing them in the home while they're keeping people isolated. So major, major problems. And then you add to that the depression of your young child, young, maybe 60 if you're 90, you know, but nevertheless, they, there's people dying around you from COVID. That's not a good feeling when you're old. So I think it's been a disaster for older people. Uh, we most probably could have done a much better job if we had decided to start with Moss early on and not cut back as much as we did. Uh, you know, protecting people by masking, uh, distancing, keeping as much of business open as possible would have been a much better situation than where we are now. 
Um, they, uh, somebody on Pence's committee asked me my opinion. That's what I told them. And I told them get a vaccine quickly. They totally ignored me, which I guess means they recognized I'm a good Democrat and they thought I was trying to tell them what not to do. But realistically, as I pointed out, both Democrats and Republicans did absolutely terribly during the, this period. Thank you. Um, there was a follow-up question. Can the frail criteria be used to decide allocation of ventilator if advanced directive is not in place? The frail itself is actually... The question, the, sorry, so there are a lot of frail uh, uh, criteria. We have a rapid thing called the frail, which has five questions. It's set up to get people for primary and secondary prevention. It's finding people early before they are going to need ventilators or anything else. And it's used to get them into exercise programs, treat them if they're depressed or if they've got sleep apnea. And we've got actually a protocol to do this. So that one would not tell you who should go on a ventilator. What can be very useful is the frail NH, which is really equivalent to the Rockwood frail index, but it's uh, only six uh, different questions. It works just as well as the Canadian frail index. And it picks up people who are going to do poorly. The vast majority of people uh, who are, have frail NH positivity are gonna be dead within six months. So it's a really useful, tool for people in nursing homes to show them and say, would you not prefer to stay in the nursing home than go to a hospital when you get sick? Because truthfully, you're going to be much more miserable in a hospital and they're most probably not going to fix anything for you. And if you have good doctors working in your nursing home, uh, you're going to do really well. If you have good nurses working with you, we can do most of the things. So I think something like the frail NH, though it hasn't been tested for COVID and ventilators, would be a useful way to look at people. But we need to recognize that from my point of view as a geriatrician, I'm interested in finding people who are almost not frail and stopping them going on to becoming severely disabled and frail. But we can use some of these uh, 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 measures to decide who should and shouldn't uh, be treated. And we're almost finished developing a whole uh, telehealth program to test people for all of this stuff, look for their problem, and then be able to give good advice, most of which is going to be done by AI and machine learning, because I've come to the conclusion that as doctors age like me, we can't remember enough of what we're supposed to do. And most healthcare professionals, unfortunately, have not been well taught taught about all the different geriatric problems. And so turning it into something where the computer will tell you what needs to be done, then you can go ahead and do it, uh, will be much better. And in our experience in Perry County, rural county, a social worker has run this program and really has done far better than any physician I've ever seen. Thank you so much, Dr. Morley. Now we are gonna take a four minute break and. There, if there are any more questions from the audience, feel free to put them in the Q&A. And we're also going to have the full Q&A panel at the end of the conference. So you're welcome to stay for that. Thank you so much. Thank you.